a uh, BCBA and licensed behavior analyst in Texas. I'm also a PhD student in school improvement studying um, autism and transition services into adulthood. And I'm Amy Oda. I'm a licensed professional counselor uh, for the state of Texas and we are in private practice as Raising the Ground. So the question here is, why is the Autism Society of Texas important to you personally and to the community? Uh, well, for me personally, um, when our son was denied uh, testing uh, at age five, six, or seven, you remember timelines better than I do, um, I, I didn't know where to turn, I didn't know where to start to fight that, and so um, we asked, uh, I called the Autism Society and, and Hart um, uh, called me back and gave me a, a a list of resources and a pep talk and um, it really uh, set us on the right path and I was uh, eternally grateful for that. In addition to that, I've been working with the population for over 20 years, uh, starting in the public schools as a special education teacher. And <clears throat> as uh, somebody at the high school level who is in charge of writing those transition plans, I knew I was writing statements that didn't really have much backing, um, and I really enjoyed working with my students who um, were on the autism spectrum, and I, it just drove me to learn all that I could about, uh, about autism and just really uh, engage in the community. Um, so knowing that the Autism Society of Texas is available uh, as a resource um, and just the philosophies that you guys have about like in inclusivity and community um, you know, those are, those are huge to know about and, and have been very helpful um, as I've continued with my career and taken it to in a different direction. So what is one thing you want people to know about the Autism Society? What, it set, what sets it apart from other organizations? I think the biggest thing that I've learned is just the, uh, you know, how much it is about community and, um, you know, nothing about us without us. Uh, so really listening to the voices of um, people with autism and other neurodiversities, um, just really like changing the language that, that we're all using and building our understanding over time. Um, it's been incredible to see just the, the, the changes over the last 20 years um, in our understanding of autism in general. Uh, but you've had a little bit more direct engagement with the autism society. So mm -hmm. we'll, just, well I, I think what it sets it apart from other organizations is the fact that it's a uh, from the beginning of its history the Autism Society of America was a partnership between practitioners and the families and, and it was the first organization to give families a voice uh, you know as a support group uh, and then also access to those resources that they needed in the community as autism was uh, becoming more and more known um, as a disorder or uh, a difference, as we, we call it now. Um, and um, also, at, you know, at, as a huge advocacy for legislation, um, you know, uh, being able to affect change and you know, from the, the capital all the way to school districts, you know, helping families and parents and individuals to be able to have that voice um, and make sure that they're getting the services and supports they need. Okay, how long have you both been involved with AST and what has been each of your favorite, most meaningful, impactful parts of being a part of the AST community? Um, my first real step into this was in 2010 when I attended the, my first um, Autism Society conference. It was held in Dallas that year. And the experience was just really just very eye-opening. And, you know, I loved the the immersiveness and just how inclusive it all was and, and listening to all the different voices and presenters and, and how, you know, you see these organic clumps of people kind of uh, gather outside of the, the uh, scheduled um presentations um, and just really engage in some very meaningful conversations and discussions with, with one another. Um, I feel like that was a very impactful experience on me and, and that was as I was beginning my graduate school um, endeavors. 
so that helped really kind of, you know, solidify my path towards uh, really, really investing and in working with this population, kind of specializing in this area. Um, yeah, it was just, it was just a huge, uh, that was a very impactful experience for me. So I was really excited for uh, Michael to be able to go with me. We went in 2014 to the Indianapolis conference, um, and it was, it was very exciting, and then from there. Yeah, and I, I think that, um, uh, you know, the conference was eye-opening. I love the fact that there were, you know, I was playing two roles, because by that time, uh, Carter had been diagnosed with autism, um, and so we were still fighting the fight uh, with the school to, to, you know, get him services. Um, and, um, I, you know, and I was going through my own personal um acceptance of, uh, you know, Carter having a difference. Um, and what, there were two, two conferences that I attended, and the first one was in 2014, and I think the next one I went to was in 2016 or 17, yeah. And that was the on the Hill legislative uh, day as well. Um, but the first conference was very impactful because I was able to meet other parents and talk about uh, similarities, um, how uh, Carter's autism was different than you know other people's autism, and how there were people there that had similar stories of fight and struggle and you know uh, helping their child become more functional and. Uh, the foreign land, different planet, weird planet, whatever you call it, um, and uh, and what was also impact, very impactful was meeting people on the spectrum as adults advocating for themselves. I mean, one of the most um, memorable sessions I had was on the whole concept of person first language, and how there are many people uh, on the spectrum there that disagreed with per first person um, and to me it was it was just like that moment in the Temple Grandin movie where you know she stood up and said well I have autism and you know told mm -hmm. her story to me it was that impactful but actually the most impactful that that experience I had with the autism society was the and it completely changed the direction of my involvement with autism society but also in my career path and that was the day on the hill. Um, the fact that we as a small group, I mean, we were like three or four in our group, you know, there were many, many people advocating that day. Uh, I had the, the great honor to um, go with Jackie Benestante and learn from her <clears throat> how, to, how to go to a representative's office and speak, um, you know, our, our platform, uh, and, and what I saw, uh, I'll give you a quick story, what I saw was um, that our we were directly impactful because when we went to, I believe it was John Carter's office, and um, the you know, we met with the staffer, and we explained about the, the Autism Cares uh, Act and how it was going to sunset. His remark was, thank you so much for telling us this because we don't want this to slip by like Chip did. And what that, in that exact moment, I realized the power of advocacy, the power of democracy, and that just an ordinary person that got on a plane and made an appointment can impact, um, you know, help impact all of the, uh, the services and supports that individuals with autism receive now. And so that that changed my focus in my own career to work on policy and make sure that, um, you know, the research that I do will impact that for services to come. Um, so here's a good, good question. We're going to enjoy this one. How did the name Raising the Ground come about and what does it mean to both of us? So a long time ago, Michael and I started our relationship as colleagues. 
and we we taught together um, at Westwood High School, and he was a, a math teacher who taught um, high uh, at risk students, uh, juniors and seniors, and I was a special education teacher, running an inclusion based program. Uh, support program for students with social emotional behavioral challenges so a lot of my students were in his class and it was a challenging class so I was present a lot of the times just to kind of help facilitate the class and you know we, we really developed a very strong working relationship I mean I guess it was there from the beginning but um, I think the, this conversation happened I think once we were dating um, I think it was during the lunch that we had together uh, that we were just kind of talking about our, our philosophies as educators. You know, that's what all new couples do, right, is kind of discuss <laughs> their um, educational philosophies. Um, and, and Michael was, um, you know, we, both of us were in positions where we were constantly uh, adapting what we were doing to fit the needs of our students and really try to understand like from from their standpoint we had the privilege to really to to see the potential in each of our students and to understand kind of what all the years of education leading to that point ha had done to their self-esteem to their their skills their you know all, all along the way we could see where there were just kind of holes that, that kept them from being able to achieve um, the, you know, the standards that, that were in place. So we're kind of wrapping our heads around this. And I think you said something like, I don't want to lower the bar, mm -hmm. you know, meaning the lower the expectations. I don't want to lower the bar. It's like we need to. And I think we both said it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Not lowering the bar, but raising the ground. So that, that really kind of encapsulates our, um, our philosophy uh, as we've, you know, developed our, our um, private practice. But he thinks that he came up with it by himself. Yeah, stuff, well, so. <laughs> I was ready for a fight, but you went for the, you went for the uh, common ground. Okay. I think so I we probably both came said up with raising it. and you kind of jumped, like we're just kind of <laughs> completed it together because, you know, that's, that's just how we roll. So, so who owns the <laughs> copyright, though? I'm more owner. Of <laughs> <laughs> well, to build off of what she was saying, um, you know, just teaching mathematics, you know, not necessarily with people with autism, uh, and and having worked with at-risk populations for uh, 20 years of teaching, mm -hmm. uh, what I noticed, and I still notice this in my own practice is that when you lower the bar of expectation, then their own personal performance lowers with it. It, it was almost, I could, could have done a dissertation on it. It, 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 it. it followed behavior analysis before I even knew what that was. <laughs> and and um, what I feel very strongly about is, um, you know, reasonable goals that are, are individualized, but at the same time, it's not um, lowering the expectation because the individual won't do it or doesn't want to do it. It's about, you know, how can we help you become a functioning citizen in our community? That doesn't mean that you are going to be uh, living on your own in an apartment, cooking your own meals, uh, working at a uh, job with a college degree, you know, we, we don't have this vision of the perfect citizen, but what we do have is, is a, a citizen or a, a member of our community who contributes mm -hmm. and it has fulfillment, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what we want. So um, we try to keep that bar as high as possible uh, that's reasonable um, and attainable so that the individual um, and families will continue to strive for that. Um, and that's that's why we, we call it Raising the Ground, by providing all those supports and services to get to that achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, another another one that we've, I think we, I'll give you, uh, <laughs> I'll give you the credit okay. for this one. But uh, really it's, it's about a ladder that has rungs mm -hmm. uh, and we often uh, Amy came up with this is that you know uh, speaking about you know certain people certain <laughs> family members maybe uh, you know 
oh, he has a ladder with no rungs, you know, and, and I've used that analogy a lot and it's been an eye opener for a lot of my clients and students where, you know, okay, you want to be a video game player for a company. Let's look at all of the steps you have to go through and once you have those steps uh, established and discussed, uh, then it becomes more of a reality in, in what you have to do. And sometimes people go for it, and sometimes people say, well, maybe I'll study U.S. history, <laughs> things like that. Mm -hmm. So therapy is perhaps often thought of as individualized or medicalized. How do concepts of community and belongingness factor into your therapeutic model? Well, you know, absolutely, like I touched on just, just a moment ago, the, you know, individualized you know we come from an educational background we took that to heart it is supposed to be for the individual um, but you also need to take into the family's wants and needs the functionality of the individual in the community uh, do they need to have a job do they need to have those job skills do they need to be able to go to a gaming center and be able to uh, get there safely uh, socialize with the other patrons and be able to get home safely uh, those kinds of things uh, the family's culture that is a huge part of that um, that I learned in my graduate studies uh, that we often forget about um, and uh, so that's what that element has always been a part of us um, and we bring in all those other elements of community and the family uh, for therapy, but one thing that I think you'll you'll agree upon um, is that we are not about the medical model. We do not see autism as a deficit that needs to be fixed. We feel uh, very much uh, attached to the social model of uh, difference, and that um, it, you know it. A person with autism, uh, you could um, have an analogy of, you know, somebody who uh, speaks English and goes to a French country. You know, it's not about that those pe those situations are, um, you know, that person needs to be fixed. They just need some, some uh, skills so they can translate what's going on around them. I also like to look at it as an, uh, an operating system. So it's a, once you know the operating system, then you can understand and, and, and work with that within that operating system. Um, we would never take a game that's designed for an Xbox and try to play it on a PS4 because uh, they, they run differently. So, you know, understanding what, what that person and how that person operates and kind of what that looks like within the context of their community, their family, you know, the larger um, society, their career, whatever it is that, that's important to them, and then working out like how, how do how do how do we need to what needs to happen in order to make this fit and work for everyone. Um, I think the other aspect to mention here is uh, the concept of interdependence. Um, independence is not necessarily the goal in a society. Uh, we do have a society that's very interdependent. You know, we need to be able to rely on certain systems to work for us um, while we are also finding out, we're figuring out the ways that we contribute to those systems to be able to continue to function together and in support of one another. Um, yeah. That, that's, that's, one, that's a really good point because one of, the, one of the aspects of cultural diversity that you know, that we've both been learning about, uh, but especially in my graduate studies, is that, you know, 60, 70, 80 percent of the world and more and more of our own country is collectivist, not individualist. Uh, yet our transition plans, our medical model, everything is geared towards independent individual uh, and I think we need to get away from that there are some elements that are very important to that I you know I we know that for mental health that an individual playing video games all day long even though that may be what they want <laughs> is not necessarily healthy and they need to get out they need to you know be productive they need to feel feel uh, fulfillment from their activities during the day so Yes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be severed from their parents and family. Mm 
It doesn't mean that... Um, or their video games. Or, or, or their video games. It doesn't mean using online platforms is not a form of socialization and social, as we've seen in, in the past few months um, mm -hmm. during COVID. So it, it, it's a very, um, that interdependence that encapsulates that, that we're getting away from the idea that um, you must be independent by 18 or you're developmentally delayed. You must be in an apartment and have a job by age 22. Or, or you're not, you're not succeeding. That's that shouldn't be the case, and it's it's really culturally ignorant mm -hmm. of of what um, uh, is expected, or you know, in around the world. But as our country becomes more and more diverse culturally, uh, in our own, even in our own uh, backyard, um, on the website you distinguish. This is just for Amy, mm -hmm. so. Uh, on the website, you distinguish between the phrase back to normal and forward towards balance. Could you elaborate on this distinction and how it fits into your um, conception of the therapy process? Thank you for asking this question. This is this is something that's really important to me. Um, I don't feel like they're, you know, we use the word normal far too much, and I don't think that it's really a, a very healthy word to use or something to really strive for. Um, currently in our country and in our world, we're facing um, two major issues to which back to normal is not an option. Normal, what we've, what we've understood as normal when it comes to, you know, uh, dealing with a, a pandemic or, or health, healthcare and, uh, you know, providing for everybody's needs um, wasn't working. It, it hasn't worked in our country for a long time, and I don't. I'm not trying to get political or anything, but um, you know, we we've those are glaringly obvious now um, to a lot of people that you know we can't go back to what it was before this pandemic hit. Um, same is true for uh, race relations and um, you know how our how our um, police and you know. Uh, you know, what am I trying to say? law enforcement um, continue to to interact with the public and interact with communities, there need to be changes, right? So back to normal did not work. Normal did not work for a, too many people um, in our communities. So those are two really good examples of why we do need to move forward. We've got to move away from what normal was because it was not healthy and it, and it was not effective and not sustainable um, <clears throat> in those particular systems. For an individual, especially somebody that is seeking therapy, well, we're seeking therapy because something isn't quite right. You know, we want some things to be different about our lives the way they are right now. Um, for a lot of the people that I work with um, who have autism, normal might mean that they have been masking and, and hiding their autistic traits in order to fit in to you know their relationship or into their job or into their school or, or whatever it is and it's just not working for them anymore so we don't want to go back to that point of normal of masking and making that fit we want to get to a point of really like accepting ourselves and then working within that to figure out okay well, how can my my me as my authentic self continue to be a part of this um relationship, this family, this uh, workplace, this school, this friend group, whatever it is that they're striving for, whatever they're trying to, to, to work out um, in their surroundings. And that idea, like form, forward towards balance, that would also include sustainability. So we need to be able to have those coping skills that are sustainable, right? Sometimes it means changes that we need to individually make and incorporate for ourselves. And sometimes it means things that we need to advocate for within our environments or help to uh, train those environments to adapt to us and our needs and just say like, I, this is who I am and this is how I'm going to function and, and you can do something that's going to help me. Um, so that's kind of my, my long answer to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For Michael, what are some specific examples of how your graduate education in technology integration and autism spectrum disorders has informed your work with Reason the Ground? So, um, the best example I can come up with is a recent example. So, using the technology for online learning during the COVID 
crisis um, really showed how technology can be used in a good way and um, in, in a and you know not productive way. So there were uh, instances uh, you know where clients needed help with navigating through um, the immense amount of text and and assignments that were thrown at them in order to you know continue their learning or maintain their learning uh, and get a grade. Um, so the technology that I use. Uh, like Google Classroom, you know, using simple to-do lists in the Google Classroom or in a Google Doc, um, using self-reports to remind, you know, a digital self-report through a Google form so that um, someone can kind of uh, mentally check, did I do this, did I do this, did I do this? And then the other part of the technology integration in the the behavior analysis that I do is um, the kind of the um, self monitoring. Um, it can't be done without the technology because everything then becomes, you know, on on your word of honor. Um, and so, for instance, um, if if we knew that there were certain assignments that needed to be done during COVID then what would happen is um, I would be able to go in and check to see those things were done. And once there was an a re, a understanding or a reality that, oh, somebody's checking this, um, more and more of those assignments would get done on time. Um, and we saw a positive um, correlation with those that data. Um, so I think things like that, uh, from what I've learned, um, what works and what doesn't work, our groups, uh, for instance, when we've had to switch to an online format, what really helped in, in making those successful was understanding what online communities um, you know, need in order to be successful, uh, that facilitation. Um, the ease of the platform, um, the social connection, making sure you're bridging from face-to-face -to, -face to uh, online, synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, all of those elements from my graduate studies at UT have played into, as a teacher, have played in as a therapist, um, as a father. Uh, they, they played into uh, and guide and inform what we do for our therapy. And, uh, you know, honestly, I think we're way ahead of the curve um, for a lot of uh, other um, practitioners because I had already had that immense amount of uh, research background uh, knowing what works. Um, so I think that um, for autism in particular, uh, this, this is the part that I, I, I want to end our talk on. For autism in particular, what's very important is that you meet them where they are. So a lot of times we'll get calls about, well, they're on the, you know, my son's on the computer all day long and, and we just, we need a detox and, and uh, they're addicted and et cetera. And that may be true. Uh, and that is one form to go. But that hasn't been what technology research has shown us, you know, you, you, mm -hmm. you just don't pull the plug and, and expect in a world and a culture and a society that is technology dependent that you're, you're this, in, this one individual because they have a hard time self-regulating shouldn't be on it at all. Um, but scaling back, earning more, meeting where they're at, using those technology tools in our own therapy has been very um uh, successful and has allowed um, more and more uh, teaching of those self-regulation uh, skills um, had it been that we do paper-based uh, therapy um, and then expect them to you know slowly go back into the world of technology and be able to self-regulate on their own and it just doesn't work that way you have to you have to engage them in something that they're interested like the, yeah. the um, the D&D and the Nintendo Switch and mm -hmm. oh, Roblox, um, <laughs> all those online things that they're at, 
um, and that changes. And so being being aware of where the technology is at also um, is important to connect um, with your with uh, the clients that we that we're with. And when it comes to that uh, technology addiction, um, we really approach that in the same way that you might approach uh, more of a, a food issue. Um, rather than you would approach like a drug and alcohol kind of thing. So mm. looking at addiction in a different way, <clears throat> where with food, the, the goal is to establish a healthy relationship with food rather than to cut it out uh, altogether. Um, so that's what we do with the technology and gaming and all of that is we're working with our clients to help them establish that healthy, sustainable relationship um, with their, their you know, activities of choice um, so that it doesn't interfere with um, the way that they need to lead their lives or the you know, healthy ways to, um, to engage um, in, within their, their lives. All right. Well, I think that's, that's all <laughs> that's, the questions. That's long enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, again, we want to thank the Autism Society for featuring us, us this month. Um, uh, we're excited for the bike ride in, in the fall. Uh, and please look out for us, find us, talk to us. Uh, we're more than happy to speak to anyone in the community uh, to talk about sports and services and, and of course, our own personal um, triumphs and tribulations <laughs> through the autism spectrum yeah. of Texas. The autism spectrum of Texas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we want to thank the Autism Society of Texas. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.